the Northern Territory and Christmas Thank you. Island. Senator McCarthy, being 2 p.m. I call Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. Under the guidelines for special purpose aircraft flights, other, otherwise known as the VIP flights, the minister is required to table schedules every six months. Under this government, it has routinely been tabled late. Two weeks ago, the Senate ordered the Minister for Defence to table the schedule for VIP flights for the period ending June 2019. Why is this minister continuing to disregard that order? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for that question. Uh, in short, the government is not disregarding that order. Order. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. At the last Senate estimates in October, the Department of Defence revealed that this minister had set on, sat on the most recent schedule for 71 days. So, can the minister advise the Senate on what date the Department of Defence provided her with the schedule for the period ending 30th of June 2019? How long has she been sitting on it this time? Senator Reynolds. Senator Wong, thank you very much. I don't have those dates with me, but I'll take it on notice and get back to you as soon as I can. But I can assure Senator Wong and the Senate, Mr. President, that uh, I completely reject her suggestion that I've been sitting on it. Senator Wong is well aware of the time frame and the processes, Order. and that was followed to the word by myself. But I will get. No, it is not Senator Wong. Senator Wong, I will get the dates. Senator Wong, I will get the dates for you and come back to you as soon as possible. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Can the minister give an undertaking that she will ensure that this schedule, which is already delayed, is tabled prior to the estimates? If not, can she please advise the Senate what it is in that table, a schedule that, she, that the government doesn't want the public to know? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Wong, yes, I can uh, confirm that it will be tabled before estimates. And again, I categorically reject uh, the categorisation of this process. Order. Senator Fawcett. Order. Senator Fawcett. Order. Oh. Order. Well, the, 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 microphones, the microphones still work. Oh, Senator Fawcett is on his feet. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, Minister, could you update the Senate on what actions the Morrison government is taking to keep Australians safe and to protect Australians from the global challenge of coronavirus? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Fawcett for the question. Uh, Mr. President, I am advised that the number of diagnosed cases of coronavirus has now exceeded 80,000. Just over 2,750 people have now lost their lives due to the coronavirus. In terms of the 80,000, the majority have been reported from mainland China, with 2,752 cases reported from 39 countries and regions outside of mainland China. The situation globally has seen significant jumps in Japan, South Korea, Iran and parts of northern Italy, with Austria, Switzerland and Croatia reporting their first confirmed cases. 25 per cent of all reported cases outside of mainland China are associated with the Diamond Princess cruise ship, while 36 per cent are from South Korea. As the Prime Minister and the Minister of, uh, for Health have stated, Australia is not immune to the coronavirus and its impacts, but we are as best prepared as any country can be in the world today. The government's decisions from the outset have been to exercise an abundance of caution that continues, and we are not complacent going forward. The government is working constantly to keep Australians safe. That is our number one priority. On 21 January, the Chief Medical Officer made the decision to declare coronavirus a disease of pandemic potential. This triggered a series of actions in Australia. The standing up of the National Incident Centre, the standing up of the National Medical Stockpile, 
the readiness and activation of the National Trauma Centre, daily meetings of the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee and meetings of state, territory and Commonwealth health ministers to discuss pandemic readiness. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you update the standard on the status of those Australians who have been diagnosed with the coronavirus? Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Mr President. 23 cases of what is being referred to now as COVID-19 have been confirmed in Australia. There are 15 cases which have been identified in general population. All 15 of those cases have now been cleared and discharged from hospital. This is a positive step and a positive reflection on the Australian health and medical services system. Eight cases have been diagnosed associated with the Diamond Princess repatriation flight from Japan. The cases are residents of Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland and Victoria. All of these cases have been repatriated to their home states for isolation and care. The most recent case confirmed overnight is noted to be the partner of a recently repatriated Diamond Princess case. The case is receiving care in isolation in Victoria. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate how the government is helping Australians through this crisis by containing the threat and providing Australians with the support they need? Senator Cash. Uh, Mr President, again, as the Prime Minister and the Minister for Health state, our priority is to keep Australians safe. The Prime Minister said there's a global virus and we're seeking to contain the virus. And unfortunately, there will be instances where there will be inconveniences for those who would have been in transit and who have been travelling. That's regrettable, regrettable, but you have to put Australia's national interest first. We will continue implementing border measures to screen passengers on flights and vessels from mainland China and for people who have been in or transited through mainland China in the past 14 days. These measures are all kept under regular review. We will also continue to work in close cooperation with state and territory government authorities and our international partners. Uh, the government can reassure Australians that our nation is well equipped and prepared for this global health challenge. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Cole Beck. In response to the uh, Senate order for, for production of documents number 387 regarding the colour-coded uh, spreadsheet, uh, this one here, the minister tabled a heavily redacted document, a heavily redacted document pre pre preventing Order. projects from being identified and the government's decisions uh, to Order. be appropriately scrutinised by the parliament. What is the basis for the minister's claim of public interest immunity on this redacted information? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Farrell, for the question. The reason for the redaction? Order. Order. Uh, order on my left. I'm trying. Senator Colbeck needs to be given an opportunity to answer the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The answer to that is in the letter I presented to the Parliament. Oh, wow. oh. Senator, order. Order. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Why are you hiding? Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister explain how it is in the public interest to redact not only the identity of unsuccessful applications to this program, but the details of projects that we're uh, seeking to fund? What does the minister not want the Australian public to know? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the I refer the senator to my previous answer. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes. Order on my left. Yes, I senator do. Farrell is on his feet. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a further question. Uh, what, what discussions did the minister have with the prime minister or his office prior to claiming public interest immunity? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President. Uh, I consulted with a number of colleagues' officers with respect to the tabling of those documents as appropriate, 
because some of those do the documents that were tabled uh, had order. Senator Colbeck, Senator uh, Wong, on a point of order. Uh, point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the question is specifically about conversations with the Prime Minister and his office. Um, the minister has been speaking for 11 seconds. Uh, he was talking about his discussions with other ministerial officers. I'm not going to say that is not directly relevant um, because he has only been speaking for 11 seconds. The minister to continue. But it was a comprehensive answer. Senator Colbeck, you're free to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I was saying, I consulted with a number of colleagues' officers in the preparation of the documents for the re for the return to order. Uh, for the order for production of documents, because the documents and the, re the order for production of documents uh, related to a number of colleagues' offices, including the Prime Minister's. The, Senator, the Minister has concluded his answer, Senator Wong, so I will move to Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia is joining with international partners to address the global challenge of malicious cyber behaviour and publicly attribute this activity? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his very important question. Uh, the Australian government last week joined with international partners to condemn Russia's malicious cyber activity, which targeted the state of Georgia in October. The GRU, Russia's military intelligence service, carried out a series of disruptive cyber activities uh, against a range of Georgian web hosting providers that resulted in defacement of several thousand websites. They included websites belonging to the government of Georgia, to the courts, the NGOs, to media and to business. The incidents that we, in an international alliance, have attributed to Russia have harmed Georgian citizens' ability to simply go about their lives, to have created insecurity within their country and undermined their democratic institutions. This follows public attributions that Australia and international partners have made to a range of malicious cyber behaviour previously by North Korea, by China and Iran. We believe in standing firmly with allies and partners to reject such conduct which poses a clear threat to the international rules-based order and, frankly, to our own values. Countries, including Russia, have all given undertakings to act in accordance with international law and norms in cyberspace. Where it serves our national interest, we believe in calling out countries that fail to live up to this agreement. Doing so, in our view, helps to foster a safe and secure cyberspace. Collectively, with like-minded countries, we want to ensure that our citizens can participate in a cyberspace that is a dynamic engine of economic growth and innovation, not a vector of interference or sabotage. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Will the minister advise the Senate how making public attributions helps uphold norms in cyberspace and helps ensure an open, free and secure cyber domain? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is the Australian government's view that there must be consequences for malicious behaviour in cyberspace. Public attribution is but one tool to uncover the culpable state. Removing that anonymity under which it hides to, uh, to uh, protect its malicious cyber conduct. We assess each incident. We calibrate our response accordingly, and our responses may include publicly or privately calling out unacceptable behaviour, but they can also include other measures. We'll ensure that our responses are proportionate, are compliant with domestic and international law, as well as with the norms of responsible state behaviour in cyberspace. We believe that the rules-based order must apply equally online as it does offline. As a responsible state committed to this principle, we must do our part to hold states accountable when they breach the agreed framework of responsible state behaviour in cyberspace. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the minister update the Senate on what else the Australian government is doing to promote an open, free and secure cyberspace? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Patterson for his question. Australia is in the leadership of global efforts to ensure an open, free and secure cyberspace that protects national security and allows technology and connectivity to remain forces for good. Uh, at UN Leaders Week in New York, I co-sponsored with the United States and the Netherlands the Joint Statement on Advancing Responsible State Behaviour in Cyberspace. 
It's an important statement, and along with Australia's international cyber engagement strategy, it highlights Australia's role in promoting an open, free and secure cyberspace. That work has been led by Australia's Ambassador for Cyber Affairs, Dr Toby Feakin. Holding states appropriately accountable when they abuse the rules-based order is a vital constraint on the behaviour of those who would use cyberspace to destabilise democracies, to undermine institutions and to disrupt critical infrastructure. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Cash, and refers to the Australian Health Sector Emergency Response Plan for COVID-19, which was endorsed by the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee on the 17th of February. Is it not the case that the plan discusses three scenarios for the impact of the virus in Australia, ranging from low to moderate, and then high clinical severity, with the third scenario comparable to the 1918 H1N1 Spanish flu? Doesn't the plan further advise that for the moderate and severe uh, impact scenarios, new health emergency legislation uh, may be needed to support outbreak response-specific activities? What new legislation is the government planning to introduce or, uh, or to encourage states and territories to adopt to prepare for the possible widespread outbreak of COVID-19? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question and for some prior notice. Senator Patrick, I've been able to obtain uh, the following information for you. The Australian Health Sector Emergency Response Plan for novel uh, coronavirus is already being implemented and brings together the successful actions we've taken to date as a government to contain the virus. The plan is in response to the COVID-19 outbreak and is based on the Australian Health Management Plan for Pandemic Influenza, which has been in place for many years. The plan is the result of coordination, consultation and collaboration with the sector and with our state and territory colleagues. It also outlines clear responses and actions we can escalate should the risk increase. It ensures we target resources and public health interventions to most effectively protect the health of all Australians. To date, we have been able to contain the spread of the virus in Australia, and we will continue to do all we can to hold this position. Uh, but the COVID-19 outbreak could pose significant risk to Australia to people's health uh, and our economy. The response that we've had to date has been one based on the principle of precaution and minimising risk. We've been working closely across all levels of government, implementing strategies to minimise the spread of the disease through strong border measures and widespread communications activities. Uh, the plan we've released goes beyond what we're already doing and looks at what we now know about the COVID-19 and how we move forward as this outbreak unfolds. It will be updated as we learn more about the virus, its key risk groups and when potential treatments or vaccines become av available. Australia's plan to manage uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is based on these pillars, pillars. Monitor and investigate outbreaks as they occur, identify and characterise the nature of the virus and clinical severity of the disease, contribute to the rapid and confident recovery Order. of individuals, Senator communities Cash, and communities. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Given that prudent planning requires timely action to prepare a, a, for a global uh, pandemic scenario with uh, severe, severe impact in Australia, what new legislation and other measures will be put in place to ensure, if required, uh, that there is effective, uh, effective social distancing, prioritisation of essential medical services, guarantees that, uh, uh, in respect of national logistic and supply chains functioning effectively and that vital goods and services remain available. Order. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator Patrick, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee will advise on which activities to undertake and escalate this plan. This will be done in consultation with relevant parties and on advice from expert bodies. Uh, as the government has shown to date, we will continue to follow the expert advice. Communication is a priority under the plan to ensure the delivery of timely, accurate and comprehensive clinical information to health professionals and the broader community so that they can effectively manage patients, implement COVID-19 control measures and minimise their own risk of exposure. Uh, you can be assured that under the consistent that consistent with the plan, the Australian government, in collaboration with states and territories, 
um, are putting the planning for all scenarios, and we are communicating with the broader community and the private sector. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, can you assure the Senate that all necessary national health emergency legislation will be considered by the government and introduced into the parliament as a matter of priority, bearing in mind uh, that only four sitting weeks uh, for the uh, House of Representatives and only uh, two for the Senate are scheduled over the next three months? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as I have stated on a number of occasions now, uh, the Australian government is well prepared and we will continue to follow the expert medical advice. Uh, you'd be uh, aware that on the 21st of January 2020, um, the human coronavirus with pandemic potential was listed, uh, or was listed as a listed human disease under the relevant legislation, the Biosecurity Act 2015. What that did was it enable uh, the enhanced, use, uh, enhanced border measures. All states and territories themselves have powers to issue orders under public health legislation that include provision for detaining persons and enforcement of those orders in relation to notifiable conditions. Authorised public health officers may issue directions to an individual, but generally chief health officers or their equivalent uh, must uh, authorise orders for detention. And Senator Patrick, I do have further information which I will provide to you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is helping protect Australians and build a more resilient economy by continuing to strengthen Australia's defence capability? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and for her a fearless pursuit of defence industry and jobs in her state. Uh, this government is investing more than $200 billion to deliver more potent, agile and a capable ADF. The investment will ensure we maintain our capability edge and are prepared for a more contested geostrategic environment in the Indo-Pacific. This reinvestment is vital after years of cuts, delays and indecision under Labor which included cutting defence funding to 1.56 per cent of GDP, the lowest level since 1938. The Morrison government is getting on with the job of making considered investment choices based on capability requirements and emerging threats, as well as building a strong sovereign industrial base and creating jobs right across Australia. This financial year alone, we have invested $8.2 billion in crucial capabilities. We are moving ahead on the $90 billion naval shipbuilding plan. We are already building 57 naval vessels in Australia by Australian workers with Australian steel. Over $5 billion of investment in Army's next generation of logistic vehicle fleet has achieved initial operating capability and is ready for training and major exercises. And in fact, the fleet did an extraordinary job for our nation on Operation Bushfire Assist. And under our $18 billion commitment to deliver the next generation of airstrike capability, we welcomed another seven F-35s to Australia in December last year, bringing the total here to Australia to 13. The Morrison government is ensuring the men and women of the Australian Defence Force have the equipment and capability they need to fight and win. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on how this progress in our defence programs is creating jobs for Australia and supporting Australian defence industry, particularly in my home state of Victoria. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Key to the successful delivery of defence capability is our partnership with Australian defence industry. This is truly a national endeavour. There are thousands of companies right across Australia involved in defence projects and supply chains that are supporting hundreds of thousands of Australian jobs. It is this government that is ensuring that Australian industry involvement is maximised in all defence programs to build a sovereign industrial base that supports Australian jobs. In Victoria, for example, uh, Universal Motion Simulator in Geelong was awarded a $21.4 million contract for sustainment of six training simulators for the Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Vehicle. 
Over 50 Australian companies have contracts already supplying the global supply chain for the F-35, including 17 in Victoria. Senator Henderson. Order, Senator Reynolds. Time for the answers expired. Senator Re Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise how the self-propelled howitzer program will deliver necessary capability and create jobs for Australians, particularly in my home state of Victoria? And is the minister aware of any threats to this vital project? Before I call Senator Reynolds, I am having trouble hearing with the level of murmuring in the chamber. Order. Senator, I'll call, we're wasting time for the opposition in question time. I'll call Senator Reynolds when there's silence. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Henderson, yes, there is a threat to this project. Labor and the order. member for Corio Senator, himself. Senator Richard Cormann Miles. on a point of order. Order, Senator Reynolds. Oh, Senator Cormann on a point of order. I, inter interjections are disorderly, and uh, within seconds of you making your ruling, the opposition uh, interjected again. I ask you to call them to order. Interjections are always disorderly. I would ask people that when I call for silence, I'm going to go back to the rule where I ask people to count to ten before they start interjecting again. Um, order. I'm sure you can count, Senator Farrell. I'll take that interjection. Um, Senator Reynolds to continue. Don's the only one that can really count. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And it's no surprise that Labor doesn't want to hear the answer to this, because the only threat to this project is the member for Corio himself, Richard Miles. It is deeply, Order. deeply disappointing that the shadow minister for defence himself, whose heat seat is in the heart of Geelong, continues to talk down Geelong's ability to support this Order. project. The Morrison government is extremely proud of our commitment to build and sustain 30 self-propelled howitzers in Geelong providing vital army capability and delivering up to 350 jobs. This project is fully funded and is now underway. Mr Miles represents an electorate with one of the highest unemployment rates in this country, yet he continues to talk down this important project for army capability, which will also deliver jobs for Geelong. The people of Geelong deserve so Order, much better. Senator Reynolds. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister Order. representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Cormann. This summer's devastating bushfires have seen more than 20 per cent of Australia's mainland forests burnt. And research just published in Nature Climate Change showed that this massive proportion of the forest estate being burnt is unprecedented in any fire season, either in Australia or globally, in the last 20 years. Over five times the average amount of forest burnt in other extreme seasons anywhere in the world, and the fires are still burning. What action is the government taking to make sure that our fires can recover, and how will they ensure, assure, make sure that our forests can recover, and how will they assure Australia's children that they are taking action to put the future of our forests, carbon stores and wildlife first? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, let me reassure Senator Rice uh, and the Senate that our forests will recover. Our forests will recover. Through the history of Australia, over thousands and thousands of years, we have experienced bushfires before, uh, and, uh, and our uh, beautiful continent, uh, of course, uh, has regenerated uh, before and uh, very, very strongly. Uh, so this, we, we have, of course, experienced uh, a devastating uh, bushfire season uh, in you know, this uh, uh, last couple of months. No question, devastating. And um, a whole um, series of uh, communities across uh, rural and regional Australia in particular uh, was terribly impacted. And we are providing significant support. Uh, we have provided significant support and continue to provide significant uh, support to, su uh, to support those communities with the uh, post bushfire recovery. And as part of our uh, $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, we're also investing, of course, uh, in a, a series of uh, environmental measures to help uh, boost and facilitate uh, that rapid regeneration, bo both in terms of our fauna and our flora. Uh, in terms of the broader issue that uh, Senator uh, Rice raises, uh, of course, we are uh, doing everything we can uh, to um, protect our environment. 
uh, to help reduce global emissions and to do so in a way that is economically uh, responsible because of course we want to ensure uh, that uh, our children and grandchildren in the future uh, can continue to enjoy uh, a beautiful, the beautiful country that is ours but also can continue to pursue the opportunities uh, to have a job, uh, to pursue a career, to have a better job. Uh, to build a life uh, for themselves and for their families into the future. That is, that is what we will continue to do and we will continue to do it uh, responsibly and with uh, great uh, commitment and de dedication. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The unprecedented burning that's occurred this fire season has been with only one degree of global heating. Yet this government's feeble climate policy has us on track for 3.4 degrees of global heating by the end of the century. How does our government expect that our forests and indeed our timber plantations are going to survive that? What does a planet that is 3.4 degrees hotter mean for smoke choking our cities, water from forested catchments, endangered animals Order. and indeed Senator Rice, for the future? Senator time for the question has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, you know, I have made this uh, point on a number of occasions now. Uh, our government is committed to effective action on climate change. But we also understand that in order to address uh, the challenges of the challenge of climate change and in order to uh, secure uh, meaningful reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, we need a globally we need a global effort to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, you know what would what would not help the environment is if Australia took measures domestically in Australia, uh, which would just shift uh, emissions. Uh, with jobs and economic activity overseas, where for the same level of economic output emissions would be higher. That would actually leave the global environment worse off. Uh, and we are not in favour of uh, imposing sacrifice uh, on the Australian people that not only makes no difference to the environment, but actually would make the situation worse uh, when it comes to addressing uh, climate change and uh, the, uh, reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. So we will continue. Uh, to Order, pursue. Senator Cormann. Time for the answers expired. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. The government so far has been sticking to our last century's outdated logging laws, the regional forest agreements, which continue business as usual, even though more than 20 per cent of our forests have been burnt this, this summer. How is the government taking into account the massive impact of this summer's fires on our native forests? How can any logging of our native forests be justified, given the massive hit that our forests and our wildlife Life have taken. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, when it comes uh, to um, this very important economic activity in our forests, we are guided by the science. We are guided by the science. Uh, and you know, we're not going to be guided by ideology. Uh, we're not going to be guided by religion. We're going to be guided by the science. And we will, we will, continue, we will continue to uh, make decisions to protect our environment in a way that is economically responsible. And of course, uh, regional forest agreements are a very important part of that framework based on science. Before I come to you, Senator O'Sullivan, I think it is Senate, former Senator Edwards, Sean Edwards in the gallery. Welcome back to the Senate, Senator, former Senator Edwards. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on the rollout of the NDIS and how the Morrison government is helping and supporting Australians with a disability? The minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question on this really important issue. And I can assure this chamber that the Morrison government is absolutely committed to finalising the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and making sure that we set it up for an absolutely successful future from now on. I am really pleased to be allowed to advise the Chamber uh, that nearly 339,000 Australians who live with disability are now on, uh, are benefiting from a plan with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and, but most importantly of that number, uh, nearly 135,000 of those people are actually receiving disability supports for the first time. These are people who have never received supports before, and that's nearly 40 per cent of the number of the people that are on the scheme. But also of particular importance is that the, can, the scheme continues to increase the number of children that it's supporting. 35 per cent of new participants onto the NDIS in the last quarter of 2019 were in the age group of zero to six years of age. That means that more than 50,000 young Australians 
aged between uh, birth and six years old, are now in the NDIS. Uh, earlier this month, Minister Robert uh, released the new data that showed the backlog of accessing early childhood uh, interventions had actually been significantly slashed over the last six months. On 31 December last year, uh, on average, for children aged zero to six to meet NDIS access requirements is down now to less than three days. That's down from 43 days earlier in the year. Uh, for children currently awaiting a plan, it's now 44 days, down from 104. Uh, and children meeting NDIS access to receiving an NDIS approved plan is now 54 days instead of 129. So the backlog Order, of children. Senator Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government ensuring the disability sector continues to thrive and support all people on, with disability? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to working with Australians with disability to remove as many barriers as we possibly can, which may impede them from reaching their full potential. Because absolutely everybody in this country, Order. whether you've got a disability or not, should be able to be afforded the same opportunity to play Order, a meaningful role in our community. Uh, recently, Minister Robert actually announced a further $67.8 million worth of grants for the National Disability Insurance Agency for the Information Linkages and Capacity Building Program. These grants will go to supporting people around Australia to support them to connect with their communities, to gain employment if that's what they wish to do, and access the kind of health services that fit their individual requirements. We know these are issues that are absolutely vital to all Australians, but particularly they are important for people with disability being able to reach their goals. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister explain why it's so important to put people with disability, their families and carers first? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, it is absolutely essential that we as a government back Australians with disabilities their families and their carers. Because, as I said, we want every Australian to have the opportunity to reach their full potential, whatever that may be. And we understand that the aspiration to participate fully, whether it be in social or the economic life of our nation, is something that people with disability value as much, if not more, than the able bodied population. Um, this reform, the NDIS, is a world first, it's a once in a generation reform. I don't think since Medicare have we seen a social reform of this kind of magnitude. And we will continue to work with Australians with disability to make sure that business as usual, that they are able to undertake the kind of employment and activities in our communities, and we will continue to support them through the National Disability Insurance Scheme so that they can live their best lives. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Prime Minister has claimed his officer's only involvement in the sports rorts scheme was to pass along information. So why has the Audit Office told the Senate today there were 136 emails about the scheme going back and forth between the Prime Minister's office and Senator Mackenzie's office in just six months? Wow. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong uh, for uh, that question. Uh, that is entirely consistent with uh, the Prime Minister's statements. Order. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. The Thank you. I have a supplementary. The Auditor General's responses today state that the colour coded spreadsheet focusing on marginal and target seats shared on four occasions with the Prime Minister's office input on which applications should be awarded funding. Will the Prime Minister now admit his office was involved in the selection of winners? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, you know, what uh, is uh, very clear is that the Prime Minister, as he has said, uh, and the Prime Minister's office made representations uh, in relation to specific uh, projects, and uh, the final decision maker was uh, the uh, Minister for Sport. Uh, and uh, what I would also say, what I would also remind the chamber of, what I also would remind the chamber of, is that as a result of the minister making decisions to more fairly spread uh, the uh, grants uh, geographically across sports, uh, indeed, as a result of the minister's decision, decisions, the proportion of uh, projects going into labour seats increased 
from, a, from 26 per cent to about 35 per cent, because the independent recommendations from, the, uh, from Sports Australia actually would have inappropriately, in the, in the minister's judgment, would have inappropriately disadvantaged uh, Labor electors. And so in exercising her discretion, making sure that all of the sports were appropriately uh, supported and that the funding was allocated Order, across Order, Senator the Cormann. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Given that the Auditor General's responses demonstrate the deep involvement of Mr. Morrison and his office in the Sports Rorts program, can the Minister explain why Mr. Morrison continues to mislead Australians about his role and the role of his office in the Sports Rorts scandal? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. Uh, this, uh, the Sports Grants Program is a highly successful, very popular program, uh, which, uh, you know, which obviously, like many programs, which, like many programs, was oversubscribed. Order. And the recommendations, Order on my left. the recommendations that came from Sports Australia were recommendations which, uh, for good reason, uh, the minister. Uh, made decisions uh, to adjust in order to ensure there was a fairer, better, more appropriate spread, including making sure that more projects in Labor electorates were supported rather, rather, rather than uh, as was initially Order. recommended. And, and there Order. is the Senator Prime Minister Wong. has been uh, very clear the Prime Minister Order. has been very uh, clear uh, in describing his involvement and his office's involvement and we stand uh, by the Prime Minister's statements. Order before I come to you Senator Stoker, I could draw, if I could draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and the gallery of a delegation from the German Bundestag led by the Vice President, Mr Wolfgang Kubicki. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and particularly to the Senate this afternoon. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Dementia is one of this country's greatest health challenges and it touches almost all families in one way or another. Can the minister please update the Senate on the way that the Morrison government is helping and supporting Australians who are living with dementia and who are dealing with it in their families? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you, Senator Stoker, for the question. Uh, Mr President, uh, dementia is the second leading cause of death in Australia. Uh, and it's a significant issue for many families, as Senator Stoker has just said. Uh, and we're, we are delivering on commitments that we've made to the Australian community to better support people living with dementia. Mr President, uh, in 2019-20, the government will provide in excess of $68 million uh, for dementia-specific support and training programs that will benefit people living with dementia, their carers, service providers. Uh, this includes $17.41 million for the Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Service, $16.6 million for the Severe Behaviour Response Teams, $11.59 million for the Dementia Training Support Program, $8.32 million for the Specialist Dementia Care Program, $13.9 million for the National Dementia Support Program and $1.2 million for dementia-friendly communities. Mr President, uh, the $68 million also includes fund new funding of $10 million from 2019-20 to 2021 to increase dementia training and support for aged care workers and health sector staff, as announced by the government in November of last year. This investment will deliver on additional face-to-face -face and teleconference interventions to address the behavioural symptoms of dementia, as well as training for health and aged care providers through the expansion of dementia the Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Service, the Severe Dementia Response Teams and Training Programs. Mr President, at full rollout, the Australian Government will provide $70 million per year for the specialist dementia care program and the Order program Senator Colbeck. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Can the minister please outline what additional measures the government is taking to invest in research to help to treat and find a cure for dementia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And this is a very important question. Uh, and at the last Dementia Australia event held in uh, the parliament with the support of Senator Polly as one of the co-chairs, 
uh, we heard the voices of a number of uh, dementia, people with dementia uh, and the expression of their desire to see a cure for dementia. When we came to government in 2013, we made a significant investment of $200 million towards, the, uh, towards dementia research. Mr. President, and subsequently uh, we made a, another an, um, investment of uh, $185 million over 10 years uh, through the Dementia, Ageing and Aged uh, Care 10-year mission funded from the Medical Research Fund. Mr. President, uh, uh, as we all understand, dementia is a significant issue for Australians and we're determined to do what we can to assist to find a cure. Yeah. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the Morrison government investing in aged care to ensure senior Australians are supported? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to dealing with this issue? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated to the chamber yesterday, uh, when we came to government, uh, investment into the aged care system was about $13.3 billion. Uh, this year, uh, it will be a record of $21.4 billion. Uh, Mr. President, uh, but what we see from the other side uh, has, has been uh, absolutely uh, no commitment to investment in aged care, zero investment in, uh, in the last uh, election campaign for home care packages, zero investment in two workforce, uh, and unfortunately zero investment into improving capacity in the, in the mainstream residential aged care for, sector. What they did prom promise, Mr. President, what they did promise was $387 billion in additional taxes on the Australian economy. But of that $387 billion in additional taxes, they could not find one cent, not one cent, for home care packages or mainstream aged care. Order. 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 Senator Polly. Sorry? It's Senator Polly. Order. I've got, I'm calling a member of the opposition, Senator Wong. Order well, on my how right do you now. It? This what is inappropriate to be interjecting across the central table. Senator Polly. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please. Senator Cormann. Not only in breach of standing orders, but extremely discourteous, so I ask you to call Senator Wong to order. Senator Polly. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. When asked during question time about the Morrison government's plans to put ACAT out to tender, the minister said that it was, and I quote, actually implementing a recommendation from the Tune Review. Now that the minister has had time to consider that answer, can the minister confirm the Tune Review makes no recommendation that ACAT services be contracted out? The Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, what the government's intention to do with respect to uh, ACAT and RAS services, the assessment teams from, uh, uh, for the aged care sector? is to do what the Tune recommend, uh, recommended to do, which is to bring together a single assessment workforce. That's what the government's Order. intention to do. Uh, the government has never, has never said, as the opposition continues to dishonestly claim, that we were going to privatise. We've never said that. Uh, and I've reiterated that in the chamber a number of times. The government's reiterated Order. that a number of the times in the statements is made to the multitude of Senator dishonest motions that the uh, opposition has brought forward. We have never said that we wanted to privatise the assessment service, uh, but what we want to do is to do what Tune said. What we, we want, we, what we've said is what we, what Tune said is to bring together a single assessment workforce. And order, further, Mr. President, order further, on Mr. my left. The uh, the Royal Commission said that that was an urgent reform. So, Mr. President, uh, they said that. Order, they, I'm they order. Said Senator that that Colbeck, please. I can't hear the minister's answer. We're wasting time in question time, which is normally considered to be a time for the non government parties. I'm going to ask that people at least take a breath after I call the Senate to order. There's an opportunity after question time to debate answers. Senator Colbeck, to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. 
So we will continue to work with the states, cooperatively with the states, to bring together a single assessment workforce for the aged care sector across Australia. That is our determination. Uh, that is what uh, we think will provide better service for senior Australians, because currently within the assessment process there are a number of issues. There are duplications that exist within the system that need to be resolved. There are people who indicate that they require palliative care services that aren't getting the referrals they need. And unfortunately, Mr. President, as the Royal Commission indicated, there are young people being referred to aged care by state government ACAT systems that shouldn't be referred to aged care. The system needs to be uh, resolved, uh, and that is the government's determination. Yes. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. President, my supplementary question. Mr. Russell Broadbent, MP, said in the House of Representatives yesterday that. He had read the Tune Review's recommendations on ACAT, saying, and I quote, it doesn't say that this area should be contracted out. Is the minister's Liberal colleague correct? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, Senator Polly uh, demonstrates her lack of understanding of the way that the system currently works. Because Order. Senator Wong. Um, I, I Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This minister, instead of misleading or engaging immediately in attack on the questioner, should do his job and answer the Senator, question. Senator Wong. The direct yeah. relevance. Mr. Broadbent's quote, which is a direct contradiction of the minister, we're asking the minister to explain. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. The minister is being directly relevant, of course, because order. If, if I. Order. Can I hear the minister? Senator Wong, your point of order was heard in silence. I'd like to hear Senator Cormann's response. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. The minister was being directly relevant because he's explaining. He was about to explain how the system currently works. How the system order. currently works, and, and indeed, Senator and indeed, Wong. Senator Wong. and indeed, uh, it is it is actually not working the way Senator Polly has repeatedly asserted and the way other Labor order. members Senator have previously Cormann asserted. Senator and Senator Wong, I'm going to respectfully disagree with both of you in that after speaking for seven seconds and not having got to a punctuation mark in his first sentence, I am incapable of ruling on whether an answer is directly relevant. Um, Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Mr. Order President. on my left. Um, I, I on reject my left. the assertion that Senator Polly has made with respect to contracting out the service. Because as things currently stand, Mr President, as things currently stand, Mr President, the Commonwealth does not deliver any services. We contract to the states for ACAT services, and we contract to order. the Razzers Senator Colbeck, I have assessments. Senator Polly on a point of order. Senator Polly on a point of order. Yes. It's order on, on Senator Wong, I have Senator Polly on her feet. It's on Senator relevance, Bay. Mr President. Was Mr Broadbent correct? He has actually read the tune review. Well, Senator, What's Senator Polly, that's going to the substance of your question. You've made a point of order on direct relevance. I'll hear from Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Minister Colbeck is clearly being directly relevant. He's at pains to explain why the premise of the question, which uh, somehow seems to suggest that there is order a plan for privatisation, is incorrect. Order on my left. And, and how we are implementing the tune review recommendations is being directly relevant to the subject uh, uh, matter uh, raised. Uh, order. Order. On the point of order, there was, the minister is being directly relevant. He is dealing with, in my notes, the, a, directly dealing with the quotation that was used in the question. Your point of order, Senator Polly, goes to a preferred or method of answer, which is not a matter for the chair. The minister is addressing the quotation in the question, in my view. Senator Wong? Uh, on a different point of order, and I accept that ruling, uh, the, uh, my, my point of order also goes to direct relevance. The quote is Mr Broadbent's, not Senator Polly's. So it is not in order for the minister to assert that Senator Polly's position is correct and is incorrect. Um, Senator Cormann, on the point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, the minister is, of course, being directly relevant because uh, he is explaining why uh, the uh, misrepresentations have been made by Labor and which may have been taken on board by a member in the other place uh, are, are inaccurate. Order. Um, Senator Wong, with respect, I, 
I am listening very carefully to the minister's answer. I, I am not convinced that is a characterisation of what he was doing. Um, if he was, I would also be of the view that is a matter for debating the merits of, of answers after question time. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, the Tune Review recommended bringing together a seamless workforce. Uh, and, it, and, and in fact, the Tune Review says it should be a priority to combine the RAS and ACAT assessment workforces. That is what the, depart, what the government is determined to do. Mr. Mr. President, and I have had a very amiable conversation with Mr. Broadbent, and we agree on Order, the outcomes Senator of the Senator Colbeck. Process. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister can't even convince his own Liberal colleagues. Will the minister now correct the record? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, minister, uh, Mr. Broadbent and I, as I just said, have had a very amiable conversation with respect to his views and, and what the government would like to see. And it's as I've been saying ad nauseum for a period of time. We want to bring together the ACAT and the RAS services, as recommended by. Uh, the Tune Review. They say to bring together and create a single assessment workforce. Mr Broadbent agrees with me that that's what should happen. He wants to see, like the rest of the government wants to see, is senior Australians getting access to the best possible assessment service. Order, and, Order on my left, Senator Colbert. The best possible assessment service. Uh, through a process that doesn't provide repetition, it provides them with timely assessments, which is not happening now. It provides with them ex experience, similar experience across the country, and reform Order. is required Senator in Colbeck. space. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Regional Communications, and Local Government, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the coalition government is helping Australians living in rural and regional communities by creating additional training places for more rural generalist doctors? Um, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I thank Senator McMahon for what is an incredibly important uh, question. But I also acknowledge the great work that you have done over a very long period of time in ensuring that uh, rural and regional Australians uh, get the services that they need. Mr President, the Morrison government, uh, we are committed to continually improving rural health services um, and regional health services. This is because we recognise regional, rural and remote Australians. They deserve order, the same access order. to high quality health services as those who live in our cities. Mr President, research actually shows that doctors who train in the bush are more likely to stay and work in the bush at the completion of their training. And that is why, as a government, we're focused on addressing the maldistribution of doctors in the bush. Earlier this month, the government announced the allocation, Senator McMahon, of 100 additional training places to the Australian College of Rural and Remote Order, Medicine to train more rural generalists. Senator Pratt, Mr. take President, a breath. Order, this is Senator, because Senator rural Cash, generalists please resume your seat. I'm getting sick of people not even taking note of me calling them to silence for 10 seconds. Senator Cash to continue. Well, well thank you, Mr. President. I say rural generalists play a key role in enabling rural and remote Australians to access health services. Why? Because they provide the general practice, emergency care, and other specialist services in hospitals and communities. Mr. President, this announcement yet again demonstrates the Australian government's commitment to supporting more regional doctor training to support better care yet again and deliver better health care outcomes for rural, regional and remote communities. Mr President, we also need to ensure though, that we actually address the pipeline of rural generalists who are coming through to support a viable and sustainable workforce. And we're also doing that as Senator part of our Ayers. half a billion stronger rural health strategy. Order, Senator, Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Minister Cash, what additional incentives has the government put in place to attract and retain rural health professionals? Senator Cash. 
Mr. President, uh, we're also investing to enable medical professionals to train in regional areas. This is by expanding the existing junior doctor training program, and we're now including rural interns and doctors in their second year of postgraduate training. Senator McMahon, by the end of this year, the Rural Junior Doctor Training Innovation Fund will have funded almost 600 rotations in rural primary care settings. Mr President, the government has announced 100 new rotations will be allocated to second year postgraduate doctors across Australia, and this is at a total investment of $3.2 million. The set, uh, these are separate to the rotations that will be rolled out as part of the National Rural Generalist Pathway and is in addition, in addition to the $20.6 $20 million we have invested for rural-based interns to rotate through a primary care setting. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Minister, why is it important to maintain a consistent policy approach to supporting our regional communities and what Order, are the Senator consequences Pratt. of other approaches? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, everything I have outlined, the investment that the government is making to ensure that rural, regional and remote Australians have the same level of health care as those of us who are able to live in metropolitan centres, it is only because we manage a strong economy. It is only because we understand fiscal responsibility. If you look at what occurred when those opposite the Labor uh, Party were last in government, as we saw as a direct consequence of their failure to manage the budget, there was a direct impact on Australia's health system. This impact, of course, directly affects Australians. What Labor did was they actually stopped listing life-saving drugs on the PBS. Why? Because they ran out of money. Mr President, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we understand the benefits of a strong economy and being able to invest in rural, regional Order. and Senator remote Cash. Health. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Senator Reynolds, please. During question time, I took on notice a question from Senator Wong about the special purpose aircraft, and I now have answers to uh, her questions. Uh, I can advise that my office received the verified schedule of the special purpose aircraft flights for the period January 19 to June 19 on the 19th of February this year. As per long-standing convention, the schedule of special purpose aircraft flights is tabled twice yearly by the government once the data is collected and, verified and verification of activities has been completed. And I can confirm to the Chamber that the schedule of special purpose aircraft for this period will be tabled tomorrow. And Senator Cash. You, Madam Deputy President, um, in response to the question asked to me uh, by Senator Rex Patrick on behalf of the Minister for Health, uh, I have some further information for him, which I will now table. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motion? Oh, um, are you seeking leave to incorporate it in Hansard? I do seek leave to incorporate it into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Mm -hmm. Senator Kitching, you take, you've got a motion to take note of answers? I have, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Reynolds to the question asked by Senator Wong. So I did just live in a brief shining moment of hope, Deputy President, that we were going to get the SPA flights, the special purpose flights, tabled. The last time the schedule of special purpose flights was tabled by the minister was for the period ending 31 December 2018. I note that this was not tabled by the minister until 28 June 2019. That's eight months overdue. But this is only the last time that the manifests were tabled in this place. If you go to the Department of Defence website mm. under Defence Publications and Information to Parliament, the last time these have been uploaded for the public to see, as you would expect from an accountable and transparent government, was on 12 November 2013. That was in the 44th Parliament. Now, I'd like to read part two of the manifest tabling and reporting requirements. So let me give that to the chamber. 
Defence will be responsible to the Minister for Defence for compiling the schedule of special purpose flights for tabling in Parliament in June for the six months ending the previous 31 December and December for the six months ending the previous 30 June each year. This schedule will list all legs flown, passengers carried and hours and costings. This passage, so though that guideline, was once to be found on the Ministerial and Parliamentary Services website. It has now been removed. Instead, you can now find on the Ministerial and Parliamentary Services website under the heading VIP Operations, Department of Defence, and I'll quote it, the Department of Defence is responsible for the cost and provision of Commonwealth transport by air, referred to as special purpose aircraft. Additionally, a determination is published on the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority website. However, curiously missing are any references to scheduling or tabling. Now, I know Senator Reynolds seems to see herself as being above these issues. She's ignored uh, recent requests for the information in the chamber. I know she is very proud of her new role as Minister for Defence, a role which she obviously thinks puts her above the daily requirements of the politics of this chamber, of the requirements of this chamber. She has routinely ignored it, and I can go back, if people uh, do not believe this, to say that the last time we had special purpose flights tabled was the 31st of December 2018, now, uh, and they, that was eight months overdue. Even on Monday evening, Deputy President, at the Naval Shipbuilding Inquiry, when the government tried the old political line which Senator Reynolds also gave in her response to the question from Senator Wong, you know, what did the Labor Party ever do for us? Uh, the answer back from Defence, because they are professional people, the answer back was uh, from the, to the government senator who asked the question was, in fact, newsflash. There were projects and there was excellence in the work that was done. And in fact, Senator Wong was reminiscing only during question time that in fact the shipyards were full, were full of work that was being done when the Labor Party was in government. Now, this is a minister who twists to avoid transparency and accountability at every turn. And sadly, it is symptomatic of this government. As I have said, the minister didn't even front the naval shipbuilding inquiry on Monday night and left her own department, uh, the secretary of the Department of Defence and the chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Noonan, to come to represent uh, the, Depart the Department of Defence and left them to answer questions on what is wrong with the most expensive procurement project this nation has ever seen. You might think that she could have bothered herself to come to the table. She failed to provide an adequate explanation for the Prime Minister's party political advertisement. This was a couple of weeks ago, as you would remember, Deputy President, in question time, which included the ADF in the political ad that the PMO, the Prime Minister's office, uh, put out, complete with a donate to the Liberal Party banner running across the top. Uh, she failed to provide an adequate explanation about that. This is a minister who has refused to be upfront with the Australian public when it comes to Australia's future submarine program and the government's election commitment to the howitzer program. Uh, this is a minister who often goes missing when it counts. Uh, of course, she is trying. Thank try you, Senator. Thank you. Your time has expired, Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's such a shame that a senator who I like so much in Senator Kitching has been given such a lousy job by those opposite. They've given her the department of cleaning out the grubby jobs. And whether that's sending her into estimates to nitpick over the catering bills, over bipartisan type functions, whether it's scrounging around how much people are spending on aeroplanes, or whether it's trying to um, manufacture scandals where there's just none to see, my, my friend and respected colleague, Senator Kitching, just gets the grubby jobs over and over again. And it's a shame because she's a top person. I reckon those opposite undervalue you, Senator Kitching. You're capable of so much more than what they get you to do. I want to work with you on the big policy challenges of our time, and I want to see you elevated out 
um, of the Department of Taking Out the Trash. And um, I'm happy to give you a reference, but I'm not sure that it's going to help you an awful lot. I get the feeling that references from me won't take you very far. But there's a reason those opposite want to talk about every little grubby little thing they can try and manufacture from the, the grease trap of this building. And that's because they don't want to be talking about how their cupboard is bare. Because they came out earlier this week with what they made out was a visionary zero net emissions target for this country by the year 2050. They made out this means they're serious about climate action. And I just, I just think that's really quite funny. First, because my dear friend Senator Kitching is a pay-up member of the Otis Group, who I know has views much more like mine that say we need balance in these things. But anyway, they, they sent her out to take out the trash on that one on Monday too. It's really quite unfair. But the cupboard is bare when it comes to their climate policies. You see, they're talking about 2050 because they are so internally torn about what their climate policy should be, so torn between their desire to virtue signal to the hipsters of Melbourne against the need to fight for jobs in central Queensland and elsewhere. They're so torn, so divided, that they thought, well, we'll just dodge 2030. The government's working towards this really concrete, meaningful stuff, accountable, measurable, deliverable by 2030, but it's all too hard for us. So what we're going to do is just make the day a whole lot later. It'll give us an extra 20 or so years to work out what we stand for. But the fact is they don't know what they stand for, and their net zero emissions target for 2050 is one that they have no plan to achieve, because while the government is happy to say that, like normal, sensible, um, non-extremist Australians, we want to balance the need for being responsible with our environment, the need to be as clean as we can possibly be, with the need to make sure we continue to develop our economy, continue to make sure there are great jobs for Australians from all walks of life, no matter where they come from, no matter what their ambitions are. We understand the value of both of those things. Well. Those opposite only really know they want the Twitterati to praise them for being super green. Well, you're not super green when you can't deliver. You're not super green when you've got no plan on how to get there. You're not super green when your policies just mean we send Australians money overseas to buy carbon credits. They're not super green policies when they shut down the transport industry that brings goods to market, helps make sure we've got fresh fruit and veggies in our supermarkets, make sure that we've got items to buy when we go to the shops for a reasonable price. It's not good for Australians when they can't even have an agriculture industry in which to work, no place from which their food can be manufactured. And when they've Senator got Stoker, I am loath to interrupt you, but I do remind you that what we're taking note on are uh, questions um, from Senator Wong to Senator Reynolds, and you started off in that defence line, but you've drifted a long way away from it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's, it's just very distracting for me. I'm sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, because they are so determined to make distractions, so determined to say, we don't know what we're doing, so quick, quick, look at Senator Reynolds. Look at the, at the nasty grease that's been dug out of the trap by by Senator Kitching to, to suggest that there's something untoward about the outstanding performance of Senator Reynolds, a minister who has presided over some of the most um, challenging periods for our country as we have gone through bushfires, as we have dealt with the challenge of bringing our um, armed forces into the 21st century as we develop our fleet, as we invest in um, new bases and new opportunities for Australians to serve. But we will not be distracted. Thank because you, Senator Stoker. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. And I promise you I will stick to topic because this is an important topic, taking note of answers by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, to a question by Senator Wong regarding these special purpose aircrafts. Now, the minister has routinely tabled the schedule of special purpose flights late. In fact, the most recent ones were tabled eight months after they were due. Why? Is she incapable of being transparent? Is that what we should learn to expect of her? It is what we expect of her. 
It is what we expect of her, because it is just one example in a long, long line of examples of her failure of transparency in this place. It is another example of her complete and utter failure to be upfront with the Senate and upfront with the Australian people, just like she is failing to be upfront with the people of South Australia. Because let's not forget the submarine-sized elephant in the room here in that she is refusing to come clean on the government's intentions with the future submarine jobs in South Australia, in my home state. In fact, I'm still waiting, Minister Reynolds, for a response to the letter I wrote you in August last year regarding the full cycle docking maintenance work in Adelaide. It has been seven months. Seven months. Is eight months the magic number? Because eight months is what we've got with these special purpose flights. Is eight months the magic number? I've been waiting seven. Seven months for a response to my letter about these jobs in my state of South Australia. Will I be waiting longer? Will I ever get a response from the minister? My state has been waiting for an answer. I have been waiting for an answer, and it's pathetic. It is absolutely pathetic. This minister could not care less about transparency. She could not care less about giving an answer, and she could not care less about jobs in my state. To be very, very clear, these jobs were meant for South Australia. They belong in South Australia, and there is no justification, no justification at all, to take them out of South Australia. We are not talking about a new procurement process here. We are talking about jobs that exist in my state, that already exist in my state. Jobs which families rely upon. Collins class full cycle docking has been based at the Osborne shipyards in Adelaide since 2003. These are jobs which South Australian families need. Hundreds of direct jobs that we're talking about. Hundreds of direct jobs, not to mention thousands of indirect jobs. Jobs which affect business confidence in my state. Jobs which affect the future of my state. But let us not pretend the other side cares at all for jobs in South Australia. Not many marginal seats anymore, is that it? Nothing to rot? You don't care about jobs in my state. But you can't just keep dragging us through this, expecting us to stay silent and expecting us to take it. We lost Holden on your watch. We lost car manufacturing in my state Senator on your watch. Senator Smith, again, you started off on topic. It is taking note of questions from Senator Wong to Senator Reynolds. Yes, and I am getting to the point and going to the point of transparency, which is Thank what this you. question came to. And the question of transparency extends to a record of this minister. It is a pattern of behaviour, a pattern of behaviour which explains her failure to answer questions today, her failure to answer questions of Senator Wong. It is a pattern. It is the same pattern we are seeing in her portfolio when it comes to these jobs in my state when it comes to submarine jobs in South Australia. I've been waiting seven months for a response to my letter. Senator Wong has been waiting eight months for a response to the matter in question. Do we mean so little to you? Does transparency mean so little to you? And do the people of South Australia and jobs in my state mean so little to you that you don't even bother to answer? There is no more pressing issue in South Australia for the people of my state than these jobs. So why won't you answer our calls for certainty? Why won't you be transparent for us? Why won't you tell us, tell these workers what their future holds? Why won't you tell them if they're going to have a job? Why won't you tell them? Be honest to the people of South Australia and for once stand up for jobs in my state. Stand up for submarine workers in my state of South Australia. That is what we expect of you. Transparency. Fairness. And we want to know, are these jobs going to be there? These jobs Thank you, which Senator belong in my Smith. state. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Deputy President. Taking note of answers is an op is a opportunity for the opposition to hit on the topic of the day, the burning issue for them in their service to the people of Australia. And what was it today? The special purpose aircraft manifest and its tabling in the Senate. 
I confess, when I go to the supermarket, everybody wants to talk to me about the tabling of this manifest. It is just so vitally important to them to be able to manage their household budget. It's so vitally important to them to know what we're doing about the coronavirus. It's so important to them to know uh, about their job security or about our defence capacity and defence capability. What they want to talk to me about is exactly what the Australian Labor Party has raised as the issue today. No, not so. They actually want to talk about the real issues, Deputy President. They want to talk about their job security. They want to know how unemployment can come down even further, that there will be security for coal miner jobs, that this government seeks to govern for all Australians and not just for green inner city elites. And yet here we have the alternate government, led by Mr Albanese, coming into this place, telling the Australian people that their topic of the day, their concern for the Australian people is the tabling of a manifest for special purpose aircraft. If ever there is a classic example of the Australian Labor Party living in the Canberra bubble and unable to extract itself from it, today is the example. Really, do we honestly believe in this chamber? And it seems that the Labor Party does, their tactics team does, their leadership does, that given the opportunity today to raise a matter on taking note of answers, they should come up with this zinger of a question about the tabling of a manifest for special purpose aircraft and how late it is, and that then becomes the topic of the day. I am sure every single news bulletin in the nation will be leading this evening with this issue. Of course they won't. It won't even make the newspapers, and nor should it, because this is an example of a political party completely and utterly divorced from the true aspirations, from the true needs of the Australian people whom they are sworn to serve. And to think that the Australian Labor Party presents itself as an alternate government concerned about the well-being of the Australian people, yet when given the opportunity of half an hour to debate an issue of the day, what is it? It's the tabling of the manifest for special purpose aircraft. Yeah, this, this really is unbelievable. Who on earth is responsible for these tactics, for this decision, that this is going to be the issue that is going to consume the time of every man, woman and child around Australia this evening as they sit down to dinner? Really? Is this the best the Labor Party has to offer? Well, Madam Deputy President, I can indicate to the Australian people who might be listening into this broadcast that sadly, yes, it is the best that the Australian Labor Party has to offer, but the good news is they are not in government and we, as a government, are concentrating on the issues of the day. And sure, we are dealing with issues such as bushfires, drought, coronavirus. We are getting on with ensuring that our defence capability is up to scratch, having been neglected for a good six years under the previous Labor government. And we are concentrating on those issues. And so when there may be slippage in relation to the tabling of a manifest for special purpose aircraft, I don't blame the Minister for Defence if it's not top priority when there are other issues such as mobilising our defence force to assist in the fire emergency to ensure that we get a proper submarine fleet, that we get sh proper shipbuilding capacity within our nation, and that these are the matters that should be consuming her time. They are the matters that are consuming her time, and the record is now there for people to see that we are on the big issues of the day. And I encourage the Australian Labor Party to simply keep on talking about special purpose aircraft, confirm to the Australian people that you are well and truly ensconced in the Canberra bubble and have no understanding you, of their real Senator, your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, and I also rise um, this afternoon to take note of the answers provided by uh, Minister Reynolds uh, in response to Senator Wong's question 
on the government's failure to table the schedule of special purpose flights that's been ordered by the Senate. And you know, I think that's sort of the key point here that's been ordered by the Senate, a key institution of our democracy, one of the two chambers in our parliament. And this place serves as the House of Review, but also provides that extra layer of scrutiny on the executive body. And somehow, you know, the comments earlier by, by those opposite um, seem to just want to discount the fact that the Senate has a role. You know, the fact is that this Senate has asked for these documents. And yet the government continues just to simply ignore the fact that the minister has any obligation to this place and is using this whole uh, debate as if, you know, nothing to see here. It's only a document. Don't need to worry about what's in the contents. But yet under scrutiny today, questioning by the opposition, the Labor opposition, to the executive, what we find is the minister's like, oh, well, we'll just be able to provide that tomorrow. And you sort of have to ask, why has it taken over eight months? Why has it taken the minister, her office, the department? I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who could have easily turned this document around very, very quickly. And yet, a little bit of scrutiny in this place, a bit of questioning by the leader of the opposition, Senator Wong, um, also contributions by Senator Kitching and her consistent pursuit of this government's failure to provide any form of transparency to the Australian people. And you know, I, I should know that Senator Kitchen has been doing an outstanding job in her role as Shadow Minister in, 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 in the portfolios of keeping this government accountable. And yet what we have on the, on the other side from government senators is that the, the, the minister's responsibilities to this place should just be ignored. She has no obligation to provide documents that the Senate has requested in a timely uh, manner, and I think it really does go to the core of of this government's attitude and how it perceives how democracy should work and how government should operate in this place. And quite frankly, you know, the comments by um, Senator Abetz, you know, one of the longest-serving senators in this place. In fact, the second longest-serving senator in this place. And you know, he should know better, being a former minister himself, that these documents are important. They should be tabled in the Senate when requested to do so. It shouldn't take more than eight months for such documents to be tabled. Um, you know, sure, some of these may not be burning issues in, in your local supermarket, but they certainly are important issues for the institutions that we are all elected to do, our jobs here, to represent the people. And regardless of how small the issue may be, it is still an important issue. And the fact that the government has taken over eight months to provide this document and now is being prepared to make a commitment that they will table it tomorrow, um, sort of feeds into the whole narrative that since the election last year, this government has been exposed in its failure of, uh, of transparency to the Australian people, whether it be uh, because of the sports frauds um, from the former um, Minister for Sports, Senator McKenzie. Um, what we are seeing is a consistent pattern here where this government chooses, chooses to turn its back on the processes that have been set up to make sure that the Senate can hold this government to account. You know, and it is just disappointing to see that the ministers use the opportunity after question time rather than during question time to actually answer the questions that, would, were, that, would, that were put on notice. And it is important to note that you know, having flights travelling around this country does cost the taxpayer quite a bit of money. And this is money that can be spent back into other services that the government offers. You know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars where flights, rightly or wrongly, have been flying around the country uh, for a purpose. But the point of the matter is why is it that the government chooses, chooses to withhold that information. And if it's not this document, what other documents will we expect in the future, Mr President, that this government will continue to hide? And why is it that Labor has to constantly apply the pressure on this government and actually waste question time, questions that we could have asked on other matters, and yet this government chooses to ignore the basic principles that, that uh, this institution uh, Order, Senator Ciccone. The question is the motion moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The 
ayes have it. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek to take note of the response of Minister Cormann to my question about fires and, and forests. So my question talked about the unprecedented in extent and intensity of the fires that we have experienced this summer, only under one degree of global heating, and how this is only going to get worse when we are headed towards 3.4 degrees of global heating, and the need to stop logging our forests and if our forests and our wildlife are to recover, and particularly because we know that logging our forests actually makes our um, forests more fire-prone. What was the answer that I got? It was basically total denial. Total denial of how extreme the conditions this summer were. Total denial of the science that has just been released to show that these, the, the fires that we've been through are off the scale, unprecedented on a global basis, and that is because of the climate crisis we're in. Total ignorance of the risks that global heating actually is going to have on our forests as the world gets hotter, because one degree is just the beginning. Under the government's policy, we are headed towards 3.4 degrees of warming across the globe. That's what the government's policy is consistent with. But no, complete head in the sand denial of what the impacts are going to be, and then complete denial of what the impacts of logging are. What did I get from Minister Cormann? Oh, well, our forests will recover. We're doing everything we can. But basically, the government has got no plan. It is not listening to the science, and a total refusal to listen to the science, and a total refusal to acknowledge that what we have just been through this summer is unprecedented and that it's only going to get worse. I mean, basically, what we know is that after you look at the impacts, of this summer's fires. You look at the impacts on communities, you look at the impacts on our forests, on our, forests, on our wildlife, and this is only at one degree of global heating. You think about what it's going to mean for Australia's forests under three or four degrees of global heating, and our forests are doomed. We are doomed to a future of more fires of greater extent, of greater intensity, more extreme, longer fires, of smoke choking our cities for months and months and months on end, of having our current precious wildlife that is already threatened and endangered just heading towards and heading up being extinct. Those animals will no longer exist for our children and our grandchildren to enjoy. And indeed, if we're talking about you know, the, the usefulness of timber as a product, we're in a situation where 80, almost 90 per cent of the timber that comes from Australia already comes from plantations. What is the future of those plantations under three or four degrees of warming? We saw plantations going up in, the far, in, in these fires over summer with one degree of global heating. Under three or four degrees, will we be able to maintain a, a, a plantation estate at all? Will you be able to actually maintain an area of plantation which we Greens want to have as much as anybody else in this place? But will that, will that be viable? Because you're going to have to keep that, that plantation, not have fire go through it for the 30 or 40 years that it takes for those trees to grow, to be valuable as timber. And at the moment, if we get to three, even two degrees, you know, we see, have seen the impact of one degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees of global heating. There's no possibility that we're going to be able to do that. The devastation to regional economies, as well as the devastation to our forests and our wildlife and our communities, is just going to be overwhelming. So the, the key thing is that there was no sense that this is understood and that we know that actually we do have a choice. But where that choice starts is that we've got to acknowledge that we're in a climate emergency. This is a crisis, and there is action that needs to be taken, and it needs to be taken now. There is no point putting it out to 2050. There is no point having the absolutely pathetic commitments that this government has currently got. We need to be rapidly reducing our carbon pollution now. We need to be transitioning away from burning all coal, all gas, all oil and shifting to renewable energy as quickly as possible. And we need to be protecting our forests, because these forests are our carbon sinks. Our forests are soaking up the carbon in the atmosphere. If we allow them to burn, if we keep logging them, 
they are not going to be able to continue to be that incredibly important, play that incredibly important role. We've got a choice, and the Greens are up to protecting our forests. Sadly, it seems that the government is not even on the same page when it comes Order, to those, Senator that Rice. level of protection. Time for contributions expired. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.